worship the Lord and lift our voices and give Him praise and glory and honor. He's a good God, isn't He? And He deserves all the praise tonight. So let's put our hands together and clap as we worship Him. talk about terminology, definitions, and the importance of a biblical framework. <clears throat> this is a hard subject, and there are two reasons that it could be easier if you wanted to take an easier path. The first easy way is you just start hunting down biblical texts and you beat those over the head who don't measure up. It's always a temptation for those who hold to a high view of absolute biblical truth to hold it in such a way as to hate those who don't practice it. The problem with that approach is you have to be very selective in the truths that you take into battle. You have to take your aim at sins other than the ones you personally commit. <clears throat> 
The other easy path is to ignore biblical moral absolutes altogether. Or at least to just place them all under the kind of idealistic umbrella of some divine, uh, syrupy, morally indifferent divine love. I mean, after all, everybody's a sinner. No one is in a position to judge anyone else. Jesus loves us all. So let's just live and let live. The only sin left in that system is the sin of intolerance. That's the only sin left. Sadly, the church tends to gravitate to one of those extremes or the other. And so you get people who make these, these biting, caustic, nasty-sounding, uh, Bible club them over the head pronouncements where the sinner is hated as much as the sin, or you get, and this is a growing trend among evangelicals, you know, we, we, uh, maybe we've been too, too rednecked and fundamentalist too long and it's time for the church just to recognize where the world is going and, and love everyone just like God loves everyone. My hope is to avoid both those extremes in this series. My hope is to love both biblical truth and the sinner. In fact, in fact, my conviction is that no one truly loves the sinner, any sinner, meaningfully, if he withholds the one thing that sinners need the most, and that is the redemptive, revealed, absolute truth of our loving, holy creator. For imperfect and at times self-destructive people, authentic compassion has to involve confrontation, at least at times. Live and let live is only loving if absolutely none of us is ever inclined to make a really, really bad mistake. One more thing. In mentioning our Creator, I too am making one great foundational assumption. If we have a Creator at all, then all of our rights are derivative rights. All of our rights are secondary rights. They are secondary to His rights. In other words, God, if He is our Creator, God has the most rights of any being there is. After all, He owns this creation. It is His creation. His rights, though they usually aren't considered very often, are paramount, the rights of God. Tonight I'm going to introduce this series by spending time looking at just two areas. I want to consider the terms and the definitions that are used in the discussion of sexual orientation. That sounds simple enough, but in any meaningful study, the words used are the most important thing. The words used are always the starting place. We need to make sure we're talking about the same thing. The second thing I want to do is I want to look into the broad framework assumptions that kind of carry the debate forward. You see, assumptions are where uh, arguments and opinions come from. The heat in the debate is only the result of assumptions that we often carry without putting them on the table out in the open. And so we're going to consider some of those tonight. All right? Okay. Thanks, Dudley. Point number one, terms and definitions. How the words we use change the nature of the debate. That's important. How the words we use change the nature of the debate. According to the testimony of the Reformed Presbyterian Church of North America, the word homosexuality was originally coined, as best we can tell, in German in 1869 by Karl Maria Kurtbenny. And it was introduced in a pamphlet written to oppose the adoption of what were then called Prussian anti-sodomy laws in the new constitution of the unified German state that was then being formed. They didn't want sodomy included. 
The term homosexuality was then brought into English in 1892 when Charles Gilbert Chaddock translated Richard von Kraft Ebing's writings into English. It goes way back. Now, we rarely hear that term sodomy used to describe the kind of same-sex activity that received God's historic judgment in the city of that name, Sodom. That's not my point. The important thing to take note of is the change in meaning that has taken place with the change of terms. Homosexuality is not just a more up-to-date term, not just a more polite term describing the same issue as sodomy. With the introduction of the term homosexuality, the emphasis shifted from the act that was called sodomy to the orientation of the inner sexual person. That's a key point to take note of. The issue changed from describing the act to describing the orientation of the inner person. Homosexuality's key dogma was and is people were sexually wired for same-sex attraction. And, and the fruit of this shifted the issue to the intolerance of those who were prejudiced against those who were just being what they were by nature or by God's creation. This is how the natural direction for the debate developed. Gay author Chandler Burr, in his book, Homosexuality in the Church, he's a pretty clever writer and he shows some advocates of the sexual orientation debate, how they liken it to the example of left-handedness, for example. It's simply the way some are born. Most people are right-handed. Nine out of ten people will be born right-handed. About one out of ten will be born left-handed. And we can quickly note, really, the kind of prejudice that exists, still exists, toward, I'm sorry, left-handed people. You see a clumsy person and you say, he has two. You never say he has two right feet, do you? So just to bring this point home, the terms have changed the debate entirely. In his book, The Gospel and Sexual Orientation, Michael, editor Michael Lefebvre, says this, words like sodomy, sodomite, sexual perversion, and so forth reflect the traditional presupposition that same-sex activity is a perversion of a person's natural gender role. The term homosexual, along with its counterpart heterosexual, was coined to convey the new idea that some people are same-sex oriented by nature and ought not to be prejudiced against simply because it is a minority orientation. Now, it's acknowledged by virtually everyone in both camps that some people engage in same-sex activity for factors other than inner orientation. Everybody admits that circumstances can play a role in some cases. But generally, typically, the word homosexuality is by far most commonly used as the classic definition in the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer encyclopedia. That's their name for it, GLBTQ encyclopedia. The definition is homosexuality and heterosexuality emerged as concepts in the late 19th century European medical and judicial discourse. Their introduction and popularization occasioned a revolution in the way sexual behavior was understood by linking that behavior inextricably to social identity, hastening 
cultural changes in the organization of sexuality already underway in urban areas of Europe and North America. The changing of the terms changed everything. That's in their publication. So we need to understand, we the church, we need to understand where the discussion is today. The dominant assumption of our media, obviously, our culture, obviously, and the increasingly common view of much of the church, particularly those under 35, is now such that we in the church will simply miss the point if we don't see where the debate actually lies. To show statements from the Bible, and we'll get to that, but to start with that, to show statements from the Bible that just condemn homosexual acts will leave everyone unconvinced simply because those texts address acts which the entire gay community will say, if they apply at all, apply to people who commit these acts for reasons other than being true to their inward sexual orientation. They know all the verses. The verses don't reach them because they explain them in a totally different context. This is so important. They usually don't deny these texts. I mean, some have no religious respect at all. I get that. But most, they usually don't deny these texts. They want to engage in dialogue. They want to change the thinking of the church. They simply accept those texts as saying something different from what we see them saying. You have to start with that understanding. And their interpretation, I'll tell you right now, will almost always leave a more tolerant aftertaste than more traditional interpretations. And for vast segments of our society, especially those under 35, tolerance trumps everything in the quest for truth. Tolerance trumps everything in the quest for truth. The difference in these terms is huge. You see, wicked actions make you a wicked person in any sane moral discussion. Wicked actions make you a wicked person. But orientation is like left-handedness. Orientation, you know the argument, it's like skin color. So, it just follows logically the first openly gay NFL player is likened, we knew it was coming, to the first black Major League Baseball player. And my point here is there is an evolving, carefully calculated terminology that makes these commonly heard comparisons seem utterly reasonable. They aren't. But they're made to sound completely reasonable. Now, we have miles to go. I don't mean tonight. Don't panic. We have miles to go in covering all of these arguments. The things I want to talk about, I, I want to look at the texts. I want, to, I want to look at people with sincere statements, people in the church who say, you know, but I know so-and-so, and, and right from a child, they were, they were homosexual, same-sex oriented. And, and how fair is it that they have to go all through life just squishing that desire when other people get to get married and have children doesn't seem fair, Pastor Don. Like, I get that. I want to talk about what, what do you do, Christian families, with a gay son or daughter? How, how should Christian people respond to those kinds of things? I want to talk about that. But that's not where we're starting. I want to talk about the definitions tonight. My only opening point here is we need to recognize where the debate lies. The title of this series isn't The Bible and Homosexual Acts. The title is The Bible and Homosexual Orientation. That's the hub. And that's what the church has to address. Point two. Oh, man. I'm going to have to start confessing my sin pretty soon as we work through this. Point two, how should the church respond to the way same-sex issues are analyzed scientifically? I'll talk more about this, but I want to just start into it tonight. 
Certainly, it's fair and accurate to say we've changed the terms of the social acceptability of same-sex relationships. The old-fashioned term sodomy came from the biblical account of Sodom and Gomorrah where the same-sex demands of the men of Sodom against Lot's guests were judged by that literal outpouring of hellish fire. This is very different from the contemporary terms homosexuality, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or queer. There's nothing in those terms to pin them in any way to something frowned upon by a creating God. In the first part of the last century, psychiatry led the way in searching for social influences that may have paved the way for same-sex attraction. It's, it's often overlooked. I'm not making a big deal of it. It's often overlooked that until 1973, Homosexuality was actually listed in the American Psychiatric Association's quote, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders as a Psychiatric Condition. I'm not saying it should have been listed. My only point is to illustrate the varied and frequently contradictory paths that science has taken and continues to take in mapping the cause of same-sex orientation, Christianity aside. All of this confusion is illustrated in homosexual author Chandler Burr in his book Homosexuality and Biology, where he himself says, quote, Psychiatry has succeeded in defining what homosexuality is not, but not in explaining what it is. And so what's happened is, by and large, these are generalities, but by and large, biology has taken the lead from psychiatry in the last few decades looking for a, quote, gay gene or perhaps actual brain structures associated with same-sex desires. Very few definitive conclusions have been reached. In fact, in 2009, in a pamphlet on the subject from the American Psychological Association, the scientific community was summarized like this, quote, Although much research has examined the possible genetic, hormonal, developmental, social, and cultural influences on sexual orientation, no findings have emerged that permit scientists to conclude that sexual orientation is determined by any, fact, any particular factor or factors. Many think that nature and nurture both play complex roles. There is still... All sorts of publications, I'm not denying that. All sorts of things published, all sorts of opinions. There is still no common scientific... Forget Christianity for just a minute. There is no common scientific consensus that says, here, that's where same-sex desire comes from. We're not there yet. What I want to say now is important. Christians shouldn't gloat that a dominant scientific consensus hasn't yet formed around the cause, a surefire, absolute, agreed-upon cause of same-sex orientation. There's no room for religious arrogance, and I'll tell you why. It is simply a matter of time and research before some kind of consensus will be reached. A definitive cause for same-sex desire will either emerge or be manufactured, but it will come. personal opinion. I haven't got chapter and verse, personal opinion. My own view is that this research should be welcomed by the church as a background for pastoral care for those coming to the church for God's healing, grace, mercy, forgiveness. Anything that is discovered that is true is helpful for the Christian cause. But it shouldn't change the biblical conviction as to the sinfulness of homosexuality. Those are two different things. The pastoral care issue and the biblical conviction issue. Anything that enables us to respond helpfully to the pastoral obligation to those seeking repentance and grace should be welcomed. Anything that erases the biblical pronouncement of homosexuality as a sin displeasing to God must be rejected. Do you see the difference? In those two things? Okay, you're looking at me like, like I'm sitting up here naked or something. Are you... Difference between truth that can help care for 
is not the same as changing biblical convictions as to the sinfulness of. Okay. You had me scared just for a minute. You were all just... That leads into the, praise God, closing point. Can a loving God hold us accountable for actions that seem to flow naturally from our inward disposition and character? That's it, isn't it? Can a loving God... I spent, I spent an hour thinking of the words for that point. Can a loving God hold us accountable for actions that seem to flow naturally from our inward disposition and character. Now, here's what I want to start unpacking tonight. We won't finish it tonight. We'll finish this message tonight, but we won't finish this point tonight. The reason many in the church find themselves incapable of seeing clearly through the emotional issues of same-sex orientation and seeing it as a sin, the reason is we have long ago lost the biblically robust theology of the effects of original sin on the human race. We've lost the robust biblical theology of the effects of original sin on the human race. We have, for so, why we, I don't mean we, but the church generally, we have for so long now been preaching and teaching stories, self-help, motivation, little moralisms, very little Bible, that we have made our light conceptions of the core of our faith unable to deal with our deeply flawed inner selves and the deep ethical issues that it brings to our thinking. Let me say that again, just briefly. The problem is, because we have theologically thinned out, all right, and we don't much talk about big concepts like original sin and it affects on all of us inwardly, we are not capable to bring that to looking at complex issues like sexual orientation. There's so much confusion. The proof of this lies everywhere. Chandler Burr echoes the response of many in the church today in the way he poses the question, if sexual orientation is found to be biologically determined, quote, if sexuality sexual orientation is found to be biologically determined, how can one justify discriminating against people on the basis of such a characteristic? God made gay people this way. And like it or not, there are majority and minority expressions of sexuality. Keep that quote in your head just for a second. Here's another statement. Dan Ovia, Professor Emeritus of New Testament at Duke University Divinity School, in his book, The Bible, The Church, and Homosexuality, says this, quote, We do not know for certain whether homosexual orientation is essential, that means biological and genetic, essential, or constructed, that means psychological and social, We don't know if it's either or both, but whatever is the case, even some who hold very strongly to the traditional view agree that at least some part of the gay population is immutably, unchangeably so. Should then homosexual orientation not be considered a different sexual order of creation, the actualization of which in practice would be natural? Please notice both those quotes. I know you can't remember them all, but both those quotes, notice the way both writers link up sexual orientation with the creative work of God. That's all I wanted to point out. Chandler Burr, God made gay people this way. Professor Villa, should then homosexual orientation not be considered a different sexual 
order of creation. All right? In other words, those with sexual orientation are oriented the way they are because that's the way God oriented them. But this isn't a conclusion reached by any text of Scripture. You'll notice they don't quote them. That's because there aren't any such texts. No. This conclusion is a piece of deduction. It's a conclusion reached by this logic. If people are oriented toward same-sex intercourse, then they didn't choose this for themselves. And because they didn't consciously choose their orientation, well, then it must have come from God. Now, there's something wrong here. And 100 years ago, everyone in the church would have spotted it instantly. Both these writers, both these brilliant scholarly writers, are assuming an unbroken link between the way God initially created the world and the way the world presently exists. And that's a huge omission of very, very necessary biblical data. A huge part of the story is purposely omitted. And sadly, tragically, many Christians don't even consider it. Just a reminder of some very basic theology. Consider this quote from chapter 6 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Quote, By Adam's sin, our first parents fell from their original righteousness and communion with God, and so became dead in sin, listen, and wholly defiled in all the parts and faculties of soul and body. By the way, that's talking about you, and that's talking about me. Wholly defiled in all the parts and faculties of soul and body. They being the root of all mankind, the guilt of this sin was imputed, and the same death in sin and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity. Everybody. I know that's a lot of theology to read through on a Sunday night, but the important point for our study is, is, is our, our sexual identity is included in the, quotes, all parts, of faculty, all parts and faculties of soul and body which have been disordered by the effects of sin. It's in there. Now, this is the kind of truth the whole church used to know like you'd know your own phone number. Of course, what's happened is, especially in the last 50 years, it's not considered polite, trendy, or seeker-sensitive to talk too much about sin, especially original sin. And even if we do talk about it, we limit our discussion only to outward actions rather than universally deformed inward character. And the only outward actions considered seriously sinful are those deemed sort of relationally that hurt other people, that God is the one ultimately wrong, that's never brought into the picture anymore. What's sin? Well, sin is hurting other people. It's a social thing, Pastor Don. But that's miles away from the way the whole church used to think. This isn't in your notes. Look at me for a minute. There's something I'm sure in the last 32 years I've said from this pulpit or lectern 15,000 times. And it's this. You, you never see the importance of learning theology in church until you have to confront false thinking. Because, please don't take what I'm going to say the wrong way, but I know it's going to shock some of you. Your prayer life does not guard you from false thinking. Your worship, as important as it is, doesn't guard your life from false thinking. Your prayer life opens your life up to communion with God. 
Your worship expresses your love and adoration of God. It is your knowledge of theology that keeps your thinking straight. And by and large, theology has bumped way down the list in most churches. And what happens is we don't know how to cope with things like this issue anymore. Consider this. We're almost done. Consider this just as an example of the way the church used to think. These are words written in 1776, and I know I'm probably the only guy that cares a hoot, but humor me and smile as I read them. Jonathan Edwards wrote these words in 1776. Now, unfortunately, because people people think they know a lot about Jonathan Edwards and they know almost nothing about him. When you talk about Jonathan Edwards, people think about some flaming redneck evangelist preaching sinners in the hands of an angry God. Truth be told, Jonathan Edwards rarely moved his arms or even gestured when he spoke. Truth be told, he almost always read complete manuscripts in apparently a soft, high, squeaky voice. He was a brilliant thinker. Now listen to what he said. Now I want you to think of how this relates to what I just read about from the Westminster Confession about, about how original sin has affected not just our acts, but inwardly our desires. All of us. 1776, Jonathan Edwards wrote in his Treaty on Religious Affections. Is this in your notes, this quote? Oh, okay, good stuff. Follow along. Allowances indeed must be made for the natural temper. Do you see that? That's a very old English way of talking about our, our inward inclinations. Which conversion does not entirely eradicate. Those sins which a man by his natural constitution was, listen, most inclined to before his conversion, he may be most apt to fall into still. Now, do you see what he's talking about now? He's not talking about the action at all. What Jonathan Edwards very perceptively in 1776 is writing about is, is how conversion works. You, you've got these inward leanings towards certain sins, an inward disposition, the sins that we're more inclined to than other sins. You have those. I have those. Those sins by which a man by his natural constitution was most inclined to before his conversion, he may be most apt to fall into still. Yes, true repentance in some respects, especially, turns a man against his own iniquity, that wherein he has been most guilty and has chiefly dishonored God. He that forsakes other sins, but preserves the iniquity to which he is most chiefly inclined is like Saul, who, when sent against God's enemies, the Amalekites, with a strict charge to save none of them alive, but utterly destroy them, small and great, slew the people, but saved the king. That is brilliant writing. My only point from that quote is the church was once rooted soundly in the idea that every one of us continues to be deeply affected by the fall of mankind and original sin. In Edwards' words, the sins to which we are most inclined. We are all affected that way. The present condition of the human race, the entire human race, is disordered from its proper design. We are not all affected in the same way, but that we are all affected is beyond doubt, and in fact, it's beyond our understanding. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart, not the actions, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately sick. And then, who can understand it? Who can understand it indeed? It's Paul's great burden. Romans 7, 22, 25, I see a delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. See, he's talking about exactly the same thing. 
This is the way the Apostle Paul contemplates his own inward orientation. This is the way Paul thinks of his own inner self, his own inner desires. And he says he's, he's pulled, he's oriented in ways he both loves and hates. He finds his heart drawing him into things he knows God's word disallows. This is always the way the church used to understand sin. This understanding of sin and only this understanding of sin is what brings a deep thirst for the gospel. You see, our moral struggling and our little resolutions, they're no match for this. I close with this. Throughout life, every person will struggle with sexual temptations, whether heterosexual temptations or homosexual temptations. Throughout life, some will battle pornography in ways that others won't. Some will live with a frigid or perhaps sickly spouse and must learn a forced celibacy in honoring God against their own inclinations. Some people will remain single and be drawn into a love for Christ that must drown out the absence of spouse and children and family that other people have. Homosexual men and women are not the only ones called to honor God's design in the face of extreme difficulty. Homosexuals are not the only ones called to honor God's design in the face of extreme difficulty. That is the call of Christ. True enough, not all struggles are distributed fairly. It's not a fair world. It's a fallen one. It's a world deeply disordered by original sin. Fair. Fair. Do you want to get in your car after church tonight? Just drive out to Irving and Ruth Witt's house and knock on the door and see a guy who's a relatively young man still with not much time left. And you drive out there in perfect health. Knock on the door and just say, so, so how's this fair thing work, Irving? You might be sitting by a person in this church that's buried a baby that didn't live. Your kids are in college or university. How's that fair thing working out for you? If you have to play the fair card, you're not going to get very far in this world. Because God has so orchestrated this world that we are forced to look at its fallenness. We are forced to look at situations every day that make us cry out and say, What's wrong with this? And it's to turn our eyes to God's redemptive plan for what he has yet to accomplish and what isn't done yet. The whole creation, Paul says, groans. And it affects our human sexuality as well. So not all struggles are distributed fairly, but the point of this teaching still stands. Proving a genuine case of same-sex orientation in no way changes God's heterosexual creative intent. And the church must constantly walk the difficult line of showing compassion for all forms of inward fallenness in all seekers of grace and redemption, while at the same time holding out the absolute life-giving truth of God's word, which alone can bring light into this deceptively dark world. Well, we started to just scratch the surface a wee bit.